To many people around the world, the work of zoos can be very controversial. In fact, many think it's wrong to keep wild animals in enclosures, no matter how big or small they are. But what might seem controversial to you isn't controversial to me. In fact, everything that might seem strange or unreal to you is pretty normal to a biologist, and especially a biologist that works in a zoo. If you have been in the zoo and you haven't got any shit on you, then your day hasn't even been good. <laughs> the daily life in a zoo isn't like any other daily life. And this leads me to the case why Ulm's zoo keeps calling and dissecting wild animals. If I ask you to think of a lion, many of you will think of a cute, fluffy little one from a certain children's movie also. If this cute little lion is being put down because it's sick, people get sad. But if the cute little lion is being culled because it's surplus and then used in dissection afterwards, people don't get sad. They get angry, like really, really angry. When Ulse Saw in October 2015 announced that they were going to hold another public lion dissection during the school's holiday break, an angry mob consisting mostly of people outside of Denmark bombarded the zoo with angry males, calling us monsters and murderers. There were also threats in between. If we do the same thing to a pig, not many get sad, not many react. Surplus is a term we use for animals who, from a genetic point of view, have a very low value. Their DNA are so common in the population that they are not worth much. And this would be the same for you. If you had 50 siblings yourself, then there would be too many of you with the same DNA. You wouldn't be worth much. <laughs> if you were an only child, on the other hand, then you would be very special, and your DNA would be very valuable. All surplus animals are carefully selected according to their genetic value. And this goes whether you're a lion, an emu, or a pig. During the Lion Gate, many asked why we even breed with our animals when we know we don't have the capacity to hold them. Many also ask why we just don't release the surplus back into nature. It is very good questions, and there are some very good answers to it. You see, first of all, you have to imagine that every single species is being divided into two completely different populations. You have one population out in the wild, and you have one in zoos. The wild population is often threatened, and it's threatened because we humans destroy their habitats. The zoo population, it isn't threatened. And in fact, every single species serves as an excellent ambassador for their own kind, because when you go to the zoo, you're being more motivated to help save the wild population by looking at them in the zoos. And if we manage this zoo population well, by taking care of the surplus animal, the zoo population can actually serve as a backup population for the wild one. So, why do we breed? We have to breed, because otherwise there won't be any animals. At some point, you will only have old animals, and then there won't be any population at the end. That's the same for humans. But we have to make sure that it's the right animals there, because if there are too many surplus animals, there are too many with the same DNA. And if you have the same DNA present in a population, then at some point, the inbreeding will go so high that the population will decline. It will vanish. And then we don't have neither the wild population or the backup population. But we also breed because we want to have the animals in the zoos having their natural behavior intact. And this means that for the lion, we have to have cubs because cups are glue in a lion family. If there are no cups, like this little fella here, then their natural behavior will cease to exist. Many zoos, they are using contraceptives to avoid breeding. And they are doing that because they are afraid of people's reacting to the calling. 
but contraceptives, they're very often made for humans. So you actually never know how long they'll last. And you can have animals being sterile because the contraceptives keep on working, and they should have been done two years because the animal was supposed to breed. But it just keeps on working. So it doesn't add anything to the population, neither way. If it's surplus, then it could be cold. It could have a good life and then keeps on moving. So why don't we just release the surplus animals back into nature? There are many species that are not good candidates for that. You also have species that are. But before even considering releasing any species out into the wild to reintroducing it to its natural habitat, you have to make sure that you're not releasing it into nothing. That we just destroy their habitats and then they end up dying anyway. So we could just as well humanely call them in the zoo so they have a good life and not just let them out into nature and then they will just die. There are good stories of reintroduction. The Savalsky horses, they are the last wild horse back on Earth. They are, as we speak, being reintroduced into their natural habitats of Mongolia. Every single animal is carefully selected according to their genetic value, and they are being put back out into nature, because if they're going out there and they fit with the rest, then at some point the population will thrive and we will have wild horses back out there. They are picked out from their zoo's breeding programs. But for many other species, it won't work well. The lions, they may lack certain skills to survive. If they have been raised in the zoo, they might have so dormant instincts that when going out there, they will just starve to death because they won't know how to catch their own prey. That's not good animal welfare. So instead, surplus animals are, for the most part, being culled. Let's review the lion case. We had a surplus animal being culled because there were no other institutions with the same high standards to take it. Yeah. And we just discovered why we didn't just release them back into nature. So we have a carcass here, and it's not suitable for consumption. We shouldn't eat lions. They are really toxic. We shouldn't eat ourselves, we are equally toxic. So it's not suitable to consume, but it is very, very suitable for education. And that's what we're doing. We are in zoos educating people. That's one of our goals, just as well as keeping these animals genetically healthy. So we have a dissection where we invite you, everyone that comes, to see how fascinating animals are from the inside and out. Kids, they love it. They really, really love it. And it's no matter how bad it smells, how much blood there are, they love it. It's the grown-ups that often can't handle it that drags the children away. And I get that. It smells. But you should try smelling my hands after I'm done dissecting for an hour. I, uh, I tell you, I smell really, really bad. My boyfriend, he doesn't like that very much. <laughs> so. But it's worth it, because whenever we can teach somebody a little bit, then it's, then it's worth it. It's really, really worth it. And we talk about everything that's inside an animal. We talk about the heart. We talk about the kidneys. We show where the liver is, and we take it out. And when we're done, then it's the kid's turn because they get a rat on their own, and then they try to find the exact same things. And once again, the kids love it. The grown-ups, not so much. But they try to find the heart. They try to find the lungs. They cut off the tail because they want to know how it wiggles. And they also really want to open up the skull because they want to see the brain. They are fascinated about it. We talk about what's inside the stomach. We talk about the teeth. We talk about the genitals the penis and the vagina. We talk about it all, because there's nothing too odd to be talked about. So guess what we are going to talk about now? <laughs> yes, the penis, because penises are fascinating. <laughs> but 
it is not the human penis we're going to talk about, because that's quite boring. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. You see, animal penises, they have evolved. And it's the body part that has evolved the fastest, like six times faster than any other body part. And that's because females are picky. They want the best penis out there. <laughs> yep. So for the lion, and for cats in general, they have evolved barbs on the penises. Spikes. They use them to make the female ovulate. Because the male lion, he has 20 seconds to mate. It doesn't sound like much, so he has to get it going. <laughs> but he's doing it every 15 minutes for three days and three nights, so he will get exhausted at the end, I promise you. <laughs> you also have the duck. It's a very, very common bird, but it's one of the only birds that have a penis. And I tell you, this penis, you may have seen pictures of it, it can get like 40 centimeters long, and it's corkscrewed. <laughs> and at the end, there is a tip, which it uses to remove sperm already inside the female. Because, you see, female ducks, they are often being raped. So to avoid all of these intruding penises that are coming at her, she has a vagina that is also corkscrewed, but in the opposite direction. <laughs> yes, she's uh, sort of working like a labyrinth in there to try to avoid them. But this is just animals that have one penis. You have many animals that have evolved and adapted more penises. You have sharks, they have what's called claspers. It's two penises going down the side. You have snakes, they have double up on penis heads. It's a hemi-penis. But you also have the ignita. It has four penis heads. Four! But it can only use two at a time. It has to rotate the two it's going to use, and then it has to shrivel the other two to make room so it can get in. If you want to see more penises, then go and Google, because there are so many <laughs> fascinating penises out there. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not just the penises that have evolved, also the testicles. Because if you're an animal, where the females are mating with several males, you have to make sure that it's your sperm that reaches the egg. And you can do that by producing loads and loads of sperm. But when you have that much sperm, you also have to have really big testicles to hold it. So the next time you're in the zoo, try to look at the chimpanzees or the kangaroos, because they have really big testicles. And in fact, the kangaroo is the only animal that has its testicles, and then the penis. So try to imagine that, guys. The testicles before the penis. <laughs> and I don't know why. I don't know why. But what about the vagina? Is it just like the female vagina? In many cases, the vagina is just a hole, and it's called a cloaca. It's <laughs> one hole used for urination, defecation, and mating. So that's three in one, why I have more holes. But you also have vaginas that are looking like penises. You have pseudo penises. That's what the hyena got. The vagina of a hyena can get like 18 centimeters long. So try to think of that mating with a male penis going into what is also looking like a penis. It has to be a little bit tricky. But the most tricky part is actually the birth. And the most tragic story about this is that the offsprings are often suffocating during the birth because they have to go through this long vagina. But why am I talking about this? Why are we dissecting? It's because of the penis, and it's because of the heart, and the lungs. It's because that we can learn. Every time we look at an animal from the inside and out, we learn something. And it's not just something we learn that we can help the wild population or the zoo population with, we can also help ourselves. Many of you have wondered what this is. This is a giraffe heart. You might think it's quite big, but for a giraffe, this is quite small. 
And that's the fascinating part about it, because a giraffe can get its blood two meters up in the air to reach the brain. But with this little heart, how does it do it? It is so fascinating that human doctors come to study it because they want to unlock the mysteries. And they hope that if they know how the giraffe does it, then they can somehow use that when repairing human hearts. It's not just for the heart. So many species have cool features that we are trying to use in our lives. So every time we can learn, we do it. And every time we learn something, we use it. So the surplus animals are here for several reasons. They are here because we have to have animals breeding. But we also have surplus animals that we can use, not only for ourselves, but also for the wild and the superpopulation. And every time we call an animal and we dissect it, we learn, we look at the dead, and whenever we look at the dead, we can help save the living. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow, wow.